Welcome. In this lecture, we will introduce Newton's second law, the idea of friction, and a specific case of motion that we will call falling, both free fall and non free fall. Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on the object and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. That is, the greater the force, the greater the acceleration. The greater the mass, the lesser the acceleration. And intuitively, the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. Force and acceleration. Consider the example where we apply a force to this brick. So the force accelerates the brick with some acceleration A. If the force is doubled, you get double the acceleration. Mass and acceleration. Let's begin with the same scenario we had in the previous slide, where we have one hand pushing on one brick, which produces some acceleration. If you have twice the mass, you yield half the acceleration. If you have thrice the mass, you get one third the acceleration. Mass resists acceleration. Mass is the measure of an object's inertia. It's the quantity of matter in an object. Newton's second law, revisiting it. Algebraically, how do we write this relationship between the force, the acceleration, and the mass? Well, the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. Here we have acceleration. Here we have the total net resultant force, whatever you would like to call it. And here is the mass. And of course, each of these quantities has their own distinct units. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared in the SI system. Force is measured in newtons, and mass is measured in kilograms. Put this over to the side, and let's look at this relationship graphically. So let's draw two axes. On the horizontal axis, we have the net force, and on the vertical axis, we have the acceleration. For a system of constant mass, what does the relationship look like? It's a linear relationship, a proportionally linear relationship. The more force that is applied, the greater the acceleration that is yielded. What about acceleration versus mass for a constant force and variable mass? The more mass you add to a system, the lower the acceleration becomes for a constant force. So we see again that acceleration is directly proportional to the net force, while acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of that system. Commonly, the second law of Newton is written as F net equals the mass multiplied by the acceleration. Alternate notation would be on the left-hand side of this equation, rather than writing F sub net, to write this giant Greek capital sigma in front of the F, which indicates it's the sum of all the forces. F net, or the net force, is the sum of all the forces. Mass versus weight. It's important we make the distinction between these two terms because they are easily confused. Weight is the force upon an object due to gravity. Whereas, mass, as we saw before, is the measure of an object's inertia, and it's also the quantity of matter in an object. The gravitational force F sub g upon an object of mass m is F sub g equals m times g, where g is the gravitational acceleration. This is simply saying that the weight of an object, which I'm representing here symbolically as the capital F vector force with the subscript capital G to indicate gravitational force, because weight is the gravitational force, is simply equal to the mass of our system multiplied by the gravitational acceleration lowercase g. This is also known, this lowercase g is also known as the gravitational field. And the value of this gravitational field, or the gravitational acceleration, near the surface of the Earth is roughly 9.8 meters per second squared. In the textbook Conceptual Physics, for the simplicity of calculations, this value is rounded up to 10 meters per second squared. Let's do an example. Consider a 2.5 kilogram object on the Moon and the Earth. And the purpose of this example is to demonstrate the difference between mass and weight. So here's the Moon. Let's find the gravitational force applied to some mass due to the gravitational field of the moon. You notice the subscript G sub M. I'm simply indicating that this particular G is not the gravitational field of the Earth, so it will have a different value than what was shown on the previous slide. The previous slide gave the value for the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth, but let's look at it near the surface of the moon and see how that field produces a force on the 2.5 kilogram mass. So we have 2.5 kilograms multiplied by the gravitational field of the moon, which is simply 1.6 meters per second squared, 
and this yields a force of four newtons. And as a reminder, the unit newton is the unit of force in the system of international units. What about the Earth? Well, the value of the gravitational force or the weight of an object of mass m will be different than the weight of that same mass m on the moon. And notice the subscript I have here is g sub e, where e I'm simply using to denote we're talking about the gravitational field near the surface of the Earth, and this is the value I gave on the previous slide. So we have the same mass, 2.5 kilograms, multiplied by 9.8 meters per second squared. The force is 25 newtons. Notice the difference. The mass is the same. So we take one object, put it on the moon, take the exact same object, put it on the earth, and the weight is different, but the mass is the same. So mass is intrinsic to an object, weight is not intrinsic to an object. That is important to keep in mind. Friction. Friction is the force generated by two surfaces that contact and slide against each other. It's important to note that friction always opposes the object's motion. So we have a scenario here where we have some girl pushing on a box. She's pushing to the right with some force push. Whatever that value is, it's to the right. Because she's applying a rightward force, the frictional force is opposing that, and so it is to the left. Now this is an example of solid on solid friction. Friction is a fairly general term and is not limited to solid on solid friction we can have a falling object, and this type of friction will be different, but we can still use the same symbol to represent it. So the downward force is the gravitational force, so this object will be moving downward, of course, if you drop it, and the upward force, represented again by capital F subscript script F, is the air resistance. This is the fluid friction on the solid object. So let's talk about falling. And let's talk about falling with air resistance. So let's say we have our mass, our package of mass m, and let's establish our coordinate frame or our reference frame. Again, we have a downward force due to the gravitational field interacting with this mass, giving us our weight, and we have the upward force due to the air resistance. So the force is acting on this. Well, the gravitational force, which is negative mg in the y direction, it's negative because we have established that upward is positive. And remember that the y hat is just a way of denoting direction. So y hat simply means we are along the y axis. In this particular case, because the weight is downward, we must put a negative sign here to indicate that this force is downward and we establish that upward is positive. The frictional force which I will say that the value is some r, I don't care what that r is, I'm just putting r there as a placeholder, is in the positive direction based on our reference frame. We plug this into Newton's second law, and Newton's second law as a reminder is F net equals ma, and our forces we simply add together because the net force is simply the sum of the forces. Now we plug in a little bit more detail in those forces, and then we factor out the directional unit vector, that y hat, and so we have negative mg plus r, that whole quantity is multiplying the directional unit vector y hat, and that is equal to ma y hat. And we have y hat on both sides, it's common to both sides, we can cancel it out, and this leaves us with negative mg plus r equals ma. If we solve for our acceleration, we get r minus mg all over m. And all I did here was divide both sides by m and then flip the sides. So we can rewrite this as a equals r over m minus g. Now this r, this capital R, is simply the value of the air resistance, whatever it may be. I didn't give a value here. This is just a placeholder to give you an equation so that if you ever solve a problem, you can just throw in the value here. What about falling without air resistance? Well, then we simply have gravitational force down. So the forces involved are just the gravitational force. If we plug this into Newton's second law, again, Newton's second law is F net equals MA. All we have is the gravitational force. And if we plug in more specifics of that, we get negative MG Y hat equals MA Y hat. And we remove the M and the Y hat from both sides because they are common to both sides. So we essentially divide both sides by M and divide both sides by the Y hat and we get a equals negative g. That is saying that the acceleration of this object is the gravitational acceleration, and the negative sign simply says that this gravitational acceleration is downward relative to our reference frame, which indicates that upward is positive, so if our object is falling down, that means the acceleration is negative. And as a reminder, you can choose whatever reference frame you want when you start a problem. I'm simply choosing upward to be positive here. You could choose downward to be positive, and if you chose downward to be positive, then your value here would just be a equals g. 
as opposed to my example where a equals negative g. But what is the important result that we have here? All objects fall at the same rate if there is no air resistance. And we see that because the acceleration a is equal to just a value that has nothing to do with mass. So if there is no air resistance applied to an object, that object will fall at the same exact rate as another object next to it. So a bowling ball and a feather, for example, will fall with the same exact acceleration if they are in, let's say, a closed chamber that has been evacuated. So they're falling in vacuum. With no air resistance, they will both fall at the exact same rate. Let's do an example. Problem one. Three identical blocks are pulled as shown on a horizontal frictionless surface. If the tension in the rope pulled on the right is 30 newtons, what is the tension in the other ropes? Option A, less than 30 newtons. Option B, greater than 30 newtons. And option C, equal to 30 newtons. This is an example taken from the conceptual physics textbook. Let's move this here. Let's draw a free body diagram on this first block. Now, a free body diagram is just a diagram where you draw all the forces acting on the object or the system. And our system here is just this block. And we must first establish, of course, a reference system, a reference frame, excuse me. And we have the tension pulling to the right, which I'm labeling just T1, which is the force, but I'm calling it T1, and a force due to the rope tension on the left, which I'm going to call T2. We have the gravitational force down and the support force or the normal force up. Now, because there's no friction here, we don't care about the vertical forces in order to solve what's going on horizontally. So I will write the net force just in the X direction and I will not write all the hats here because we are just going to consider only the X direction. And I could have done this in a previous example, but I decided not to. Here, I'm looking at just the x direction. So how do I write that? Well, T1, the value of T1 is gonna be positive because it's pulling to the right relative to our reference frame. And we have a negative T2 because it is pulling to the left relative to our reference frame. And that, of course, equals the mass multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction or the horizontal acceleration. Now, our goal here is to find T2 because we want to know how the tension in the other ropes compares to the tension in the first rope where the hand is pulling. So we solve for T2, and we see here that T2 is going to be less than or equal to T1. Now, why is that? Because if we look at it, we see T2 equals whatever T1 is minus something. So therefore, T2 must be less than or equal to T1. If it had T2 equals T1 minus 0, then in that particular example, T2 equals T1. But more generally, T2, the tension in the second rope, is going to be less than or equal to the tension in the first rope. And so what is our answer? Well, again, it's asking, what is the tension in the other ropes? Well, the answer is less than 30 newtons because 30 newtons was the value of the tension in the first rope. And we have just shown that T2 is going to be less than or equal to T1. So in other words, T2 is less than or equal to 30 newtons. And that will propagate onward to the left. So for every rope we have on the left, it will be less tension in that rope than on the previous rope and on the right of it. In summary, we talked about Newton's second law, friction, falling, and of course we did the example with the tensions, which is just an application of Newton's second law in a tricky, at least what I find to be a tricky problem. I will see you next time.